glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. You're most welcome to stand as you're able. Come the fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song and song my flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I fix upon. Lost in outer darkness Till you came and rescued me I was bound by all my sin When your love came and set me free Now my soul can sing a new song Now my heart has found a home Now your grace is always with I'll never be alone. Come thou fount, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. Here a bride to you we sing. Come thou fount of our blessing. Come thou fount, come thou king, come thou Prince of peace, hear your cry to you we sing. Come thou fount of our blessing. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily line comes strength to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Come thou fly.
the infinite Father, faithfully loving your own. Here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne. Oh, we're falling before your throne. You are the one that we the one that we praise. You are the one we are glory. Join me as we speak out our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and was buried. And the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Happy Father's Day, gentlemen. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, guys. <laughs> I just wanted to take a minute to say how very precious you are to our church. The kids are going to hand out a little token that is just something that will maybe last more than just a minute. And uh, we want you to know how very important you are. You're important in our lives. You're important in the lives of the people in the world today. I believe, I know that I had a precious daddy and two precious grandfathers, and I married a man that has fathered our children from the moment he knew they were coming. I believe dads are the fix for this broken world, and we cannot make it without you. We need you to know we love you. We appreciate you. God loves you. He sees you. He's for you. And we hope that this is the best year yet for dads. <laughs> You've kind of been replaced by the government. And everything has said we don't need dads. 
but I believe we need dads more than we have ever needed dads, especially daddies that are there, that are strong. This little pen says, a father, go, y'all hand me that, anchors his family in faith. Just, if you're a dad, raise your hand so these babies can find you. They've got your pen. It'd go right down the middle, and all the dads that have got their hands up, hand them a pen. If you're a stepdad, if you're a stand-in dad, whatever kind of a dad you are, we want you to have a pen. And just know that First Methodist Abilene loves you, we're behind you, and we appreciate you. Karen has a story. The only thing I have to say to you, Kim, is um, you should have furnished Kleenexes. And I love how God works because I'm kind of going to dovetail off of what you said. Last Sunday, we had a song called Is He Worthy? And stanza, one of the stanzas in verse 3 says, Does the Father truly love us? He does. And Scott made a comment about that stanza. And he asked us, do we really believe that? And I was very unsatisfied with my answer. I just kind of sat there. So I get home, and I get the song out, and I sing it to Jesus. And I'm pondering that stanza, does the Father truly love us? He does. Then I flipped it, and I asked the question, does the, I'm sorry, I'm so nervous. Does the Father know we love him? So I told him, yes, I did love him. But what I would like for us to do as a congregation is to stand and worship him and tell him out loud that we love him. So those of you who are able to stand, would you please join me and kids that includes you in the balcony. God inhabits the praises of his people. He is enthroned on our praises. He occupies our praises. So, Father, I want to confess before this church body, not just at home by myself, I love you. I love you, Jesus. You are awesomely good. You are kind. You are faithful. You are precious. You are worthy to receive all glory and honor and majesty. You are worthy to receive everything that is within me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. So, Father, I thank you this morning that you are inhabiting our praises. And I ask you, Father God, that you move among us, Holy Spirit, that you are delighted in our praises this morning. In the precious name of Jesus, we bless you, our gracious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Did, did you all get that? It'll make the sermon shorter if you did. Uh, <laughs> we got it. We got it. Yeah. Amen. Uh. The, uh, yeah. The, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, I don't know whether to, well, I'll take the offering first and then I'll. So, um, tear, tear this off your bulletin and, and put your name on there and. Uh, any new information, if you've got a new uh, email address or something that you need the church in, if you've got a prayer request, and then just stick it in the box in the back uh, as you go out towards the atrium. Uh, there's a little correction in the inside of the bulletin. The back side is right. The uh, leadership team is at 6 o'clock in the Wesley Room on Tuesday. And I want you all to be praying for the leadership team because um, they're trying to figure out what Jesus wants us to do as the body of Christ known as First Methodist. And they're going to make a decision here pretty soon because they've been praying and fasting. So if you join them in that, that would be great. And then um, in July, uh, I've got to get out the calendar so i got the right days. <laughs> the, uh, you know, your life is on your phone, right? Um, Starting, um, yeah, oh, I bet you if I got in July, it would work better. Um, July 11, at 10 o'clock in the morning over in the, the MAC there, uh, we're going to have a, a meeting. We're having a church meeting, and we want as many of you to come at, at 10 o'clock on, on July 11th. This will be in the newsletter, so you don't have to memorize it now unless you're putting it in your phone so you remember. The... Uh, uh, at 10 o'clock, and we're going to talk about what's going on in the Methodist Church, and all this talk about disaffiliation and what that means. And then on uh, July 12th, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, because some people can't come at 10, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to have another meeting uh, to talk about the same stuff. And then on July 14th, at 6.30 in the evening, we're going to have another meeting, and uh, we have... Um, uh, Mike Schaefer, who is the conference council um, uh, on missions and administration and assistant to our bishop, who's going to, to come and, and answer all your questions about what all this is all about is, and how we can do it as far as the church is concerned. And then on July 19th, uh, Rick, Rich Jones is coming, and he is a member of the WCA and also has helped in designing uh, the Global Methodist Church and talk to us about that and answer all your questions. So there won't be, what, 6.30. So, um, and, and if you have a question, we're going to answer them all the best we can. Uh, I brought the experts in, you know, they're more than 50 miles away and they're going to come with a briefcase. So. They'll have the answers to you. <laughs> I thought it was funny too, Ginger, but apparently they didn't. So, so at least, Joel, you could have groaned and then we could have, you know, got a laugh out of them. Uh, anyway, so those things are going to happen so we can answer your questions because I know a lot of you have questions about what's happening and what's going on. And any member of the leadership team, wait, r wave your hand to those of you who are here. Look around and see who that is. Okay, we got Don and Rick and Treva. Um, uh, you can just ask them because they know it all too. Okay, and if they don't, they'll make something. I mean, they, they, they'll say, come to the meeting and find out. And so we hope that you'll join us for all those meetings, or the one that you can come to. Uh, and we look forward to that. They are in the midst of prayer and fasting to make a decision about whether to bring this whole matter to the church. And then the church on August 11th will, by secret ballot, make a vote and make a decision after we've been praying and fasting as the body of Christ at the char church conference. And the church conference will be August 11th at 6 p.m. in the MAC. Everybody's invited. Everybody should come. If you're not present, you can't vote. And you have to be a member. You can't just be somebody who joins us on Sunday. Okay? 
We love you if you just joined us on Sunday, but if you want to vote, you have to be a member. All right? And I won't ask, are there any questions, because I'm sure there are. So, um, oh, today is the day we're supposed to turn in the, the baby bottles. And so if you haven't done that, would you be so kind as to, to do that? And I have a confession to make. I signed this one out and have had it up here for five weeks, but I forgot to write the check and bring it, so it's coming. Um, nothing else I can do about that right now. So, let's pray. Father, I, I thank you for your faithful people who have been so gracious and so generous with the gifts that you've given them. And so, Father, I bless them in the name of Jesus Christ. Encourage their hearts, strengthen for the ministry that you've called them to, and help us, Lord, to be the body of Christ going out into the world to compel them to come to Jesus. And for all that, we give you thanks and praise through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just have to look. Oh, God is good. I said hellos and goodbyes, and I've held my friends while they've cried, tasted. between oh he's had his hand on everything joy comes tears fall i'm learning there is beauty in it all it's not hard to find it you just have to look just have to look oh god is good oh god is good amen did good. It's our time to pray. 
Now these altars are open. If you'd like to come down, if you'd like prayer for uh, some reason, healing, wholeness, other situations, other people, I'll be glad to pray with you. Um, let's just take some time and uh, tell God how much we love him. You can even talk out loud like Karen said uh, or, or not, but make sure that that's what your heart's doing. So come, let us uh, take this time to bow down before God our Father, Jesus Christ our Savior. Thank you, Father. Lord, we just praise your name and give you thanks for your steadfast love, for your faithfulness. You are worthy, Father. You are worthy of all honor and glory and power and majesty. Hallelujah. Blessed is the name of the Lord our God who loved us so much that he sent his Son into the world. And so, Father, we thank you Jesus Christ, our Savior, and we give him praise and thanks for his great work of redemption. And so, Lord, we thank you. Oh, Holy Spirit, we give you praise and thanks for your presence here with us, for dwelling within us, for flowing out from us like a mighty river through Jesus Christ to minister to the world. And in all these things, we give you praise and thanks. Father, we thank you for this nation, and we lift it before the throne of grace and ask for your blessing. We pray for our elected servants, for President Biden and Vice President Harris, and the cabinet, and the House, and the Senate, and the Supreme Court. And Lord, we lift up those judges who will be making a final decision here the end of this month about Roe v. Wade. And so, Lord, encourage their hearts and put a hedge of protection around them, for they have been threatened with bodily harm and death. Minister to them and encourage their hearts to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And we thank you for that, Father. Lord, we thank you that this city now has before it a, uh, uh, an ordinance that says there will be no more abortion in Abilene, Texas. And Father, we thank you that the church is rising up and that Come November and the election that that ordinance is going to pass overwhelmingly. And so, Father, raise your church up to minister in power by going to vote. And we thank you for that privilege and opportunity, Father. Lord, we pray for our first responders and ask that you would encourage their hearts and be with them and present and powerful as they minister to us. And Lord, uh, for those who serve in the military, we lift them up and we ask your blessing in their lives. Draw them to you, Father, and, 
and Lord, we know that your spirit is loose in the earth to do those very things, and so, Father, we thank you for opportunities that we have to be the voice of God as though you were making your appeal through us, Father. Be reconciled to God. And so, Father, we thank you for all these opportunities and give you praise through Christ. And we offer up this prayer that Jesus taught us when he said, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave. tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of So, so good, with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice, you have led me through the fire. Darkest night, you are close like no other. 
I know you as a father. I know you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, is running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after it's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing the goodness of God. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that worth a while? Amen. Amen. Um, the bishop told a dad joke while he was preaching. Came out of Exodus chapter 32. And um, in Exodus 32, uh, the Israelites were like, well, we don't know what happened to this fellow Moses, but um, we need a God to take us back to Egypt. And so Garen says, give me all your gold. And he throws it into a pot and poof! Out comes the golden calf. Now, we learned that um, the reason it had to, I just threw it in and out came this calf was because there had to be some kind of creation fixed to that thing in order for it to be a legitimate God. And so, poof, out came this calf was the creation that it just made itself out of the gold that he melted down. We know that's a bunch of hooey, but nevertheless, there it is. And so, uh, you know, and then Moses comes down, and he's the first one to break all Ten Commandments. <laughs> and uh, he, he throws the calf into the fire, and then he grinds it up and throws it on the water and makes them drink it. Um, he did look into uh, food and wine magazine to see about gold and whether it was digestible or not. Anyway, that's another story. But, um, you know, they had to make a decision about gold or God. And so the bishop said, well, you know what the difference is, don't you, between gold and God? You got to get the L out. <laughs> Come on. 
Okay, boo. Uh, anyway, nobody booed when the bishop said it. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Uh, conference was powerful. The bishop just whipped us up into a frenzy and, and preached the word and, and told us to live by it. It was great. So um, today I want to talk to you from Psalm 24 about walking in the integrity of your heart. And so hear the word of the Lord, a psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, from you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. The Word of God for the people of God. Would you pray with me and for me? Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. You know, um, two things happened today already. Uh, Kim talked about fathers and the need and the importance of fathers in the life of every child. And then uh, Karen got up and talked to us about the need to, to love God. And so, really, um, this psalm is really about one thing. It may be about other things, but the, the main thing is about loving the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. And that's what it's all about. And the other thing is, is quantitatively different from loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, body. It's to love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, that's the ministry that, that flowing out of the Spirit in your life into the lives of other people. And in those two things holds the whole Old Testament and the New Testament. And that's what Jesus said it is. And so if we will walk in integrity of heart, we will experience the visitation of God in our midst. Living in the presence of God, in that living in the presence of God, there, there's wholeness. There's victory. There's healing. There's joy. There's peace. There's love. There's deliverance. Not only for us as people who call upon the name of the Lord, but for all those that we run into that we can talk to about who this Jesus is, our Savior. And so that's the heart of Psalm 24 is, is the fact that uh, people are gathering for worship and they're calling and worshiping the Lord and the Lord shows up in their midst. The King of glory. Well, if I had gotten amen, I could have quit right there. I'm going to teach you all how to say that word. I know it's hard. <laughs> so, 
You see, it's, it's, it's a preparation, Psalm 24. Um, before entering the temple to meet with God, it describes a, a convergence of worshipers with the king of glory. And in verses 1 and 2, it, it's a, it affirms God's rightful place and universal authority as the king of glory in his act of creation. And then in verses 3 and 4, the psalmist gives standard for those who want to approach God. Clean hands, a pure heart, one who does not lift up his soul to an idol, that is to demons, and those who do not swear falsely. And then in in verses 5 and 6, he speaks of the blessing from the Lord because of the integrity of the worshiper's heart. This this isn't on the slide, but over in James chapter 1, verse 8, it just talks about double-minded people are unstable in all their ways and they shouldn't expect to get anything from God. Folks, we got to make up our mind. We got to make up our mind. You see, serving God is is way beyond showing up here on Sunday. We like that, you know, don't get me wrong, but it's way beyond that. It it's 24/7, 365. 66 on that one year, you know? It's all the time. It's not just some of the time. And so uh, that's what it's talking about. And then then, uh, in verses um, um, 7 through 10, he talks about this, this great welcoming party. You know, like Jesus is coming back today and he's gonna, well, it's the eastern window, right? Uh, so we won't come through that one, sorry. Uh, from the east, and it'll be like lightning. And, and so the expectation is that God is going to show up. And so the worshipers come, and they're hungry for him. And they want his very presence to manifest in their midst. Is that the kind of hungry we are today? That's what God is looking for. People who will worship him in spirit and in truth. So there's this welcoming party in which the king of glory, the Lord Almighty, enters the gates of the temple to meet with those who have come to worship him. Now, uh, Psalm 22 uh, starts with the very familiar words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? In the midst of our situations, regardless of what they are, we, we, we feel that sometimes. It's real. I mean, those are the words Jesus spoke from the cross. It's real. It's where we are sometimes. But then... Um, He goes on in Psalm 23, because the next eight psalms are all about responding to Psalm 22. He goes on in Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And then we sang about that. Did you know that... um, the goodness of God is running out. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The goodness of God is running after you. What a blessing. And then back to Psalm 22. In the midst of what seems like despair, the psalmist says, Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of of Israel, or the praise of the church. So in it, we find support and hope in the worshiping community of the faithful. In the congregation of the faithful, God's righteous power is proclaimed. Uh, When our faith is undermined by our circumstances, this often happens, right? Hello? You know, I mean... You go through some awful stuff sometimes. And it undermines our faith because, God, where are you?
you know, God, if you're for me, why is this happening? And you can fill in the blank or whatever that might be. When our faith is undermined by our circumstances and we are tempted to despair altogether, sometimes our only remaining hope is to place ourselves within the worshiping community of God's people. Because in the worshiping community, the presence of God is there and he ministers to us. Even if we don't feel that happening. There he is in the midst of the worshiping community, praised even when we're unable to praise him. There the mighty acts of God are proclaimed even when we cannot see them. You know, it's after God passes through that he lifts up his hands and you can see his backside because he's held you in the cleft of the rock. You know, God is very present even though uh, he remains absent in our thinking from our own experience. 24-8, the king of glory is the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. God is out there fighting this battle for us, with us. Back to the beginning of Psalm 24, verses 1 and 2. You see, God has authority over the whole earth and by the fact that he created the whole world and everything in it. And there is nothing that was made that he did not make. And the psalmist emphasizes that the stable character of the cosmos, God creates and sustains. In 1 Samuel 2.8, the foundations of the earth are the Lord's upon them. He has set the world. In 1 Chronicles 16.30, tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. The psalmist speaks to the authority of God as the creator of the heavens and the earth. Psalm 89, verse 11. The heavens are yours, and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in them. And then Psalm 33, 8, 9. Let the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him, for he spoke, and it came to be, and he commanded, and it stood firm. Related to the authority delivered from God's role as the creator of all of that is, is the fact that he is the judge over the creation and its inhabitants. In Isaiah 26, 9, the prophet says, My soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning my spirit longs for you. When your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness. Well, that's right out of the New Testament. The Holy Spirit comes to convict people about righteousness. And then Psalm 98, verse 9. Let them sing before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. Our God is a just God, a forgiver of sins. All we need to do is call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone who calls upon Jesus Christ will be saved. And because God has created and sustained the world, it is his. It depends totally on him for its continued existence. And he exercises authority and judgment over it. Hebrews 1.3. All creation is completely dependent for its very existence on God's continuing mercy and grace who alone sustains all things by his powerful word. The stability and security of creation cannot be isolated from right relationship with God. As a result, you and I, we, must prepare for his coming. Revelations 22, 12, 17, and 20. Uh, it won't be on the screen. You can make a note because I know you got pens now, man. Uh, you can in the notes section there. Revelations 22, 12, 17, and 20. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what they have done. The Spirit and the bride say come. That's the Holy Spirit and the bride. You're the bride. Say come. 
And let them who hear say, come. Whoever is thirsty, let them come. And whoever wishes, let them take the free gift of the water of life. Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. In Psalm 24, verses 3 and 6, here the psalmist turns our attention to, to us, you and I, who would enter the presence of the Creator God. The picture is a group of people approaching the temple, preparing to go up to participate in worship. Notice I said participate, not sit on their blessed assurance. Our gathering together on Sunday morning in the sanctuary, if you will. We ask in Psalm 24, 3, who may ascend the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place? And the questions are caused, uh, they're, they're asked to cause us who seek an audience with the Lord so th that's another question. Did you come today to meet with God? Are you seek did you seek to, to be have an audience with him? So that he can speak into your heart and life and minister to you life and health and peace. The questions who may ascend the hill of the Lord and who may stand in his holy place um, are asked to cause us who seek an audience with the Lord to reflect humbly on our need for repentance and divine mercy. And so I want to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 14 through 16 just for a minute because there, there are about 10 things there that I want us to know. Now, this is a very familiar verse, and as soon as I start it, you'll know, oh, yes, I know that. If my people who are called by my name. You see, when you call upon the name of the Lord, he puts his name on you. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise for the day of redemption. God has put his name on us. So if those whom God has put his name on will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. See, this is an if-then proposition. If, if those things happen, if those four things happen, if we humble ourselves, if we pray, if we seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, I don't have no wicked ways, preacher. Well, the Bible said you did. You know, there are things in our hearts and lives that we have not turned over to Jesus Christ. That's just being honest, right? I got them, you got them, and he wants them. Turn it over to the Lord, and God will do marvelous things for you that you do not know, more than you can imagine or even ask. Oh, Second Chronicles. So then verse 15 starts the... If you do those things, humble yourself, pray, seek his face, turn from your wicked ways, then God says, I will hear from heaven. God's going to hear you if you start walking in integrity of heart, in wholeness of heart, loving him with your whole heart, mind, soul, body, strength. I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And there's more. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Now, this is the dedication of Solomon's temple, but Solomon's temple isn't there anymore. So where is the temple of God? You are the temple of God. You are the temple of God. And so God's promise is, if you will humble yourself, call on his name, 
pray, seek his face, turn from your ways, that he will hear you from heaven. He will forgive you. He's going to heal this land. His eyes will be open and his ears attentive to your prayers. He has chosen and consecrated you so that his name may be in you, on you forever. And his eyes and his heart will always be with you. You see, the psalm is is not a self-righteous declaration of innocence. It is a solemn admission of our dependence on the merciful grace of our God whom we approach and worship. Verse 4, the response. He who has clean hands and a pure heart who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, we must have clean hands. And the idea behind clean hands is that we have not shed innocent blood. Referring to those who are killed when they do not deserve to be. Clean hands would seem to mean those who... Palms are free of the blood of such innocent persons. Those are the people who are loving their neighbor as their self. You see, it's an outward measure of character and righteousness. And such people are free or exempt from guilt and therefore punishment. You know, to put it in our vernacular, here, it's about loving people to Jesus. And sometimes people who know Jesus need some loving too. A pure heart, walking in integrity of heart, shifts the issue of righteousness before God from external action to our interior nature. Are we loving God with all that we have? Our whole heart, mind, soul, body, strength. Uh, much as in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who walk in integrity of heart, for they will see God. Right relationship with God is determined not by obedience to external law alone, but by integrity in which our outward acts are consistent with the outward flow of an inward attitude of dependence on God controlled by Holy Spirit. Look, I preach from this John 7, 37 and 39. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit. Are streams of living water flowing from you continually? Or is there, it's hot, it's a hundred and something degrees all summer long, and the stream is dried up. You see, the one who does not lift his soul up to an idol literally means has not lifted up his soul themselves or their essential being, and in this translation, to emptiness because there is nothing there. They have no eyes to see. They have no ears to hear. They cannot answer prayer. It's just emptiness, nothing. Look, Genesis 2, 7. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Soul is the essential integrated being sustained in life by the animating breath or spirit given by God. It says, actually it says in the Hebrew, the ruach of God, the very breath of God. The spirit of God entered into the man and he became a living soul. When you get saved, 
the Spirit of God enters into you and you become a living soul because before that time you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And now you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. Well, that's a hallelujah, isn't it? Yeah, hear sign language just in case you forgot. Yeah, when we're up here going like this, that's hallelujah, okay? And so um, it's the essential integrated being sustained in life by the animating breath or spirit given by God. To speak to the soul is to seek to influence a person at the level of deepest concern. And so the enemy comes in that voice of temptation and tries to influence us to do the thing that is wrong, but we are taking every thought captive to Christ. To, to lift up a, your soul is to offer your deepest commitment of your whole self to, in this case, as I said, emptiness, nothingness. On other occasions, all in the Psalms, when lifting up the soul, it describes it is a way to God offering ourself is made. Contrast uh, uh, 24 4. Lift up your soul to an idol, to emptiness, with 25 1. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. And then again in Psalm 86 4. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. And then 143 8. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. We are to lift up our soul, our, our very essence of who we are to the Lord. You see, the emptiness to which the integrated worshiper avoids, the, the worshiper who is walking in integrity of heart avoids offering themselves is most likely some foreign deity, uh, a demon or an idol. Deuteronomy 32, 15 through 18 reads like this. Yeshurun, okay, that, that's another word for Israel, and I don't know where it came from, but that's what it means. Grew fat and kicked. Filled with food, he became heavy and sleek. He abandoned the God who made him and rejected the rock, his Savior. They made him jealous with their foreign gods and angered him with their detestable idols. They sacrificed to demons, which, which are not God. Gods that they had not known, gods that recently appeared, gods your fathers did not fear. You deserted the rock who fathered you. You forgot the God who gave you breath. Really talking about this generation and where the world is right now. In 1 Corinthians 10, 18 through 22, consider the people of Israel. So Paul is talking about, consider these folks. Do not those who eat at the sacrifice participate in the altar? Do I mean that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifice of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, and I do not want to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. I love this last part. Are you trying to make God mad? Are you stronger than he is? <laughs> Don't irritate God, folks. It's not good. You see, it's the standard of absolute loyalty to God, integrity of heart, nothing not given to God from our heart. The Loyalty to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the face. Now listen, in the face of real pressure to assimilate to the practices of our culture. This is the fight the Methodist church is in. Whether or not we're going to assimilate to the practices of our culture or we're going to follow what the Bible says. And so there are a couple things to say. This one's familiar. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Today is the day of salvation. And then um, up on Mount Carmel, you remember Elijah. Some of you met him, um, you know. Um, and he's up there and the prophets. There's one guy and there's 450 prophets of Baal. And they're there dancing and 
shouting and screaming to, for their God to answer from on high. And, and he's over there about noon. You know, they've been going at it for several hours now. And he starts making fun of them. Well, well is he taking a nap? Maybe he went on a trip. They get all done and comes to the time when he's going to make the sacrifice and they pour water all over it and, and then fire comes down and laps up the, even the water. Not only does it lap up the water, it laps up the rocks that he built the altar with and the dirt that was there and the sacrifice, the whole nine yards. But to set everything up, he asked them some questions. And, and I love the way that this translation puts it. How long will you go limping between two different opinions? Can you? Limping between two different opinions. Make up your mind. You know, if God, the Lord is God, serve him. Follow him. And if Baal or the culture, then follow it. But make up your mind. It's time to make up our minds, folks. Oh, Pastor, I've already made up my mind. And that's why I'm here. And, and that's good. Have you given everything? Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, Holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Wow. I'm glad he said living sacrifice. And then he says this. Look, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, to the culture around you. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There are not three wills. It was just three ways to say God's will. And it is good, pleasing, and perfect. And it will make you that same thing. Ouch. Sorry. The children's time took too long. <laughs> sorry, Karen. Um, I haven't even got to that part yet. I'm there. Okay. I'll be obedient. So, Psalm 24, 5. The worshiper whose inner and outer worlds are integrated in loyalty to God receives blessing from the Lord. If you are not receiving a blessing from the Lord, maybe look at where your heart is and where your actions are. Instead of lifting himself to an idol, the approved worshiper will lift himself to God. 25.1, to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. As a result, the, the integrated worshiper, the one who is whole, the worshiper with integrity of heart, the worshiper walking in integrity of heart receives blessing from the Lord. And along with blessing, the approval worshiper receives vindication. That is righteousness, justice, what is right as well. And this declaration of righteousness gives us permission to enter God's presence. See, that's the problem. Sometimes we're not even ready or equipped or able to enter God's presence because we're all over the place instead of lined up with him. And this permission comes from God our Savior, emphasizing the fact that righteousness is granted by God, not earned by faultless compliance with external laws. You know, I, I, 
I, I was thinking about this because I'm my sister asked me to do her eulogy, and so I got a few questions I want to ask her before I come to that place, and you know I'm thinking to myself, look, I know that you honored our father and mother because you took care of our father for the last five years of his life and our mother for the last nine years of her life in your home. But that doesn't get you into heaven. It's knowing Jesus Christ as Savior. Do you know the Savior? You see, and in knowing the Savior, righteousness is granted by him. Romans 5, 17. For if by the trespass one man's death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Notice it didn't say in eternity. It said in life now. And then in in Psalm 24, 6. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Verse 6 is a warning that we should follow the path just described of lifting up our soul to the Lord, to be included in the generation characterized by seeking God. And this is also our response as we dedicate ourselves to the pursuit of right relationship with God. Some of us haven't gotten there yet. We haven't dedicated ourselves to that pursuit of that right relationship with God, of of following after him, following hard after him. Having gathered at the temple sanctuary as as worshipers, we anticipate the arrival of God himself. I mean, we even have a liturgical understanding of God's presence with us. When we light these candles, they're not up here to give extra light. They're up here representing the presence of the Holy Spirit in the midst of the sanctuary. That God is here. Having gathered at the sanctuary, worshipers, as worshipers, we anticipate the arrival of God himself as the divine dwelling. The temple is the place where God temporarily resides among his people in that building back in Jerusalem that's no longer there is what it's talking about here. But we're going to move that forward here in a minute and is the center for which he makes foyers into the world. So, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? And that God's spirit lives in you. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. And again, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, Uh, 19, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price, and therefore honor God with your body. You are the instruments of God's foyers into the world. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 6, 1. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new is come, and all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You have a ministry, the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to you and I the message of reconciliation, and we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through you and me. So we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. You see, when we are rightly prepared in heart, and action, waiting for God in worship, the King of glory comes. This is the essential mystery of worship this psalm celebrates in the house of God, 
God's design is to be present with his people. 24-6, the generation of those who seek his face. And 24-8 and 10, who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle, the Lord almighty, he is the king of glory. 24-7, lift up your heads, O ye gates, lift them up, ye ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Lifting up the head is a sign of joyous anticipation and hope. When we lift up our heads, it's the sign of the hope and joy characterized by our outlook as the redeemed of the Lord. When we lift up others' heads, it is an indication of offering hope and joy where there is none. God offers hope and joy amid our struggles. That's why we take time to say, if you need prayer, come on down because we know you're struggling with stuff. We're not blind. We can see. God wants to help you, but you can't get out of your seat to come down to the altar. We want to offer hope and joy. And God offers this very thing, those very things in the midst of our struggle. Here the gates are instructed to lift up their heads, metaphorically announcing the joy and hope approaching the gathered worshipers in the person of our victorious God and King. You see, we see this played out in the joyful entry of Jesus into Jerusalem as we remember with joy Palm Sunday and look forward to his second coming, his return in glory. Psalm 24, 9, lift up your heads, O ye gates, lift them up, ye ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. The Hebrew behind ancient is a reference to eternity. The venerable doors of the temple are challenged to provide access in expectant hope and joy to the glorious divine warrior king who comes to his worshiping people. Look, the doors of your heart are being challenged to provide access with expectant hope and joy to the glorious divine warrior king who comes to his worshiping people. 24-8, who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. And so here's my question. Will you be the generation of those who seek him, who seek God's face? Amen. I'm done meddling now. <laughs> Please stand as you're able. My Father's world. It is our Father's world, 
and he is coming, and earth and heaven will be one. Go forth in peace, the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all.